and we are live. It is Thursday, November 18th, 2021, 5 o'clock p.m. And uh, the other day, yesterday, I arrived home and there was a package and I knew it was a dog shirt. I was very excited because I thought it was finally going to be the fluffy poodle shirt that I ordered a while ago and still has not come. The fluffy poodle shirt is the shirt that I think really needs to be worn on in lieu of fun. And I opened the package expecting the fluffy poodle shirt. And instead, there was a shirt that was even more challenging to one's masculinity to put on than the fluffy poodle shirt. It is... Um, what Genevieve de la Fera has dubbed the Canine Chorus shirt in honor of the Greek chorus. Uh, for those of you who can't see it, even has flowers. There's and even a little, little Nina. That looks uh, like it's a got Nina a, dog. It, it has Nina, yeah. And it's got, uh, you know, a pit bull over here. And it's got a butterfly and a goose That's flying a by. And all the dogs are really excited um, and uh, uh, also, it's one size too small for me, so every wrinkle in my chest kind of bursts through it. Uh, I feel ridiculous, Why and, do you it, have a wrinkle and I'm comfortable. <laughs> and I'm comfortable with wow. that. What's up with that? Um, I don't know. We are not allowed to have fun anymore. We are allowed to have the Canine Chorus shirt. We are allowed to make Shane Harris uncomfortable while, by wearing it while he plays. Uh, where's the lie? Uh, Shane is the intelligence correspondent for the Washington Post, the host of Lawfare's new chatter podcast, an enemy of the people, a friend of the show. Welcome back, Shane. I just want to point out to you that 52% of the audience thinks you're lying and you haven't First spoken a word yet. <laughs> this is a real vote of confidence in American journalism. One of them everybody. was me, Thanks. just to give you a hard time. Okay. Yeah. Good. So, do you have, fruit, do you have um, a fruit fly? Was it a fruit fly? Yeah, it was one of those, it's worse, it's one of those little fungus flies that's like Ugh. from like watering your plants. Anyway. So, um... If you want to be on the panel, flag yourself in the uh, ask a question box. I will uh, come get you um, and uh, uh, bring you on screen. You will be uh, hidden for a while while Shane tells his story. Remember the rules, people. You are allowed to change your vote at any time. You are not allowed to Google any facts in Shane's story. Any, like, that's cheating. Looking stuff up. You can't do real-time fact-checking. We live in a pre-internet age in all ways except Crowdcast. But we are uh, allowed, you are allowed if you have a particular expertise or knowledge to share it in the chat. To try absolutely. To absolutely. <clears throat> um Every member of the panel will get three questions to Shane. Kate will get three questions to Shane. I will get three questions to Shane. And then we will all decide whether Shane is full of shit or not. Shane yeah, Harris. I mean, not as a general matter. Not as a general matter. Um, and being full of shit is not a bad thing, um, you know, on this show. In fact, I think the, the best... The best performances on this show tend to be people who are lying and convince the audience. Do you remember Tom Nichols? God. Tom Nichols was great. And John Roush. John Roush, uh, you know, that was brilliant. All right. So, Shane, the floor is yours. I'm going to I'm gonna make you big. We're going to be little. Okay. More Go painting. for it. Do I, I love it. Do I, seem, do I seem more truthful or less truthful with these on? Well, you seem a little less truthful because we can see the reflection of the screen and it gives you a, 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 script. a vaguely demonic air. I don't know. You, well, I yeah. do like those glasses though, Shane. I vote yes for those glasses. Okay, well, thank you. These are like the blue light glasses that I should wear, but then my doctor was like, whatever, if you don't believe that stuff. Um, yeah. Okay, so <clears throat> so my story, um, it, springboards off of a question that I often get asked, which is a funny question. Um, 
well, it's a variation on a reg on a question you would expect somebody to ask. But more than once, well, more than several times, I have been asked by people who I thought understood like the process for how one goes about getting a job in government. Do you have a security clearance? And I have to just explain to them that, you know, like, no, journalists do not have security clearances. Like, we don't like that. This is not a thing that happens uh, for a working journalist. Um, but it does raise this very interesting question that then follows on where people will say, oh, well, did you ever think about, like, actually, like, going to work for the CIA or going to work for the FBI or these places that you cover? And um, I've never actually answered that question directly because the question is actually a little weird and a little uncomfortable uh, for reasons that will become apparent. Uh, the answer, which I can talk about now, because we were thinking about doing this as a story in the paper and for various reasons, we've opted not to. So I'm not scooping myself here. Um, but the answer to the story, have you ever thought about working for the government? The answer is yes, uh, I tried to. And I was rejected because I could not obtain a security clearance. So you kind of see how these things dovetail around. So whenever people would ask me this very obvious question, I think obvious, and you're a journalist who covers law enforcement and intelligence, have you ever thought to work for them? Never actually said the answer is yes, and I tried to. So I'm going to tell you the story of how I tried to go work for the FBI. Um, this is in late 2000, well, mid to late 2002. And at the time I was a pretty, still pretty green kind of cub reporter for a magazine and a website in Washington called Government Executive, which is still around, govexec.com. And this basically was, is the magazine that covers the federal bureaucracy. It's sort of the ins and outs of federal programs and management issues. It's kind of like what Business Week, when it was Business Week, would be like for people in government. And I was initially hired in 2001 as the um, junior information technology reporter. So this is before 9-11, when the big stories were in technology and government were things like uh, government agencies building websites to deliver citizens to services, like the IRS making it so you can automate your tax return. Um, you know, like what the DOD is going to do with like, you know, I mean, cloud computing probably wasn't a thing back then, but you, you get the idea, sort of fairly nuts and bolts, techie stuff. Uh, and I was covering that beat and partic particularly on the side of procurement and contracting. So a lot of the big companies that build computers for the government. 9-11 happens and the IT beat kind of becomes immediately suffused with all of these people trying to sell, you know, as they would call it, national security solution sets. Uh, basically like, you know, data management software to the intelligence community and to the FBI as a way of helping them, you know, harness the information that they had sitting in their databases, which was often, you know, potentially very useful intelligence, as we learned after the 9-11 attacks, but that wasn't being shared across agencies. And in many ways was like inaccessible or hard to get to even within the agency. So my IT beat kind of becomes a national security beat. And that's actually when I first started writing about national security. And in late, mid, late 2002, um, my editor assigned me to do a story on the FBI's just like chronic problems that they have had with modernizing, as they would put it, which is the word that I, I've come to hate, modernizing their information technology systems. And like, these are stories that are now pretty widely known, but like at the time of the 9-11 attacks, the FBI was still operating on computers with green screens. I mean, these were ancient devices. Um, all kinds of reasons for why that was that we don't have to go into. Um, it wasn't a security thing. It was just like a being backwards about technology thing. Um, and they were really, really behind the curve and had to very quickly speed up. And Bob Mueller made this like a big, big priority. So this was kind of like, a, you know, an easy story for me to do. And so I was assigned it. So, you know, I do what I always do. You know, you call the press office, you set up some interviews. The FBI was actually very happy to talk about this subject because they wanted to show that they were actually doing something about it. So I went down and there was like, you know, it's the, the standard thing when you go into Hoover building, you have like a press officer. And there were two people from like essentially the program management office for this. And there was one person who, uh, you know, a, an agent who kind of was the, the in the weeds person who could give all the technical stuff. And then there was somebody who was a bit more senior to her who was kind of in the 
more of a manager type, I guess. I mean, a, a program manager, but not a techie, if that makes sense. So somebody who, you know, probably was actually happy to have a journalist there because probably wanted to get a lot of the glory for the whole thing. So we do the interview. It's very straightforward. It goes really, really well. Like it's one of those interviews where you're asking questions and the interview and the subject is like, that's such a good question. Or like, you know, like no one ever asked that question. I'm so glad you asked it. Uh, and there was a real rapport going among the three of us. And it was a really productive conversation. The thing ends up uh, and the press officer gets ready to take me out. And the guy who's the program manager says, well, that's okay, I'll walk Shane out. I was like, oh, cool. We'll continue the conversation on the way out the front door. It's really neat. So we're kind of like walking out. And uh, as we get to the exit, um, he says, so, so are you happy in journalism? Are you enjoying this? You seem like you, you enjoy it. Uh, and I'm like, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's a, it's a pretty good job. And he's like, well, um, I think I'd like to stay in touch with you because, um, I think I saw something in that room there. You were very good at asking questions. You're very thoughtful. Uh, and I think that you should have, give some consideration to coming to work for us. And it was kind of like, oh, I mean, I mean, I was flattered, I think, and a little bit taken aback by that. And he did this really weird thing, which was very kind of like, it was threw me off my balance a little bit where he took, I had my visitor badge like clipped onto my lapel and he reaches over and he takes the badge off of me and he says, I'll be getting in touch. Um, to be honest, I thought he was hitting on me for a second, which was a little weird, but it didn't kind of, it didn't have like a creepy vibe, but it had like a weird, like, like you're being tapped kind of vibe, you know, like, you know, he wants to have a conversation with you later. And it was a little bit intimidating, but it was kind of neat. So I go home and I'm like kind of puzzling over this interaction, but it gets me thinking like, what would that be like if I actually decided to rather than cover FBI or even another intelligence agency actually to go work there? Um, would I be interested in doing that? And so wait, wait, yeah, can, yeah. I, can I just clarify and question? Yeah. Did he give you any indication of what capacity he was recruiting you Not in yet. was this like uh, a public affairs guy no this was not the public affairs guy this was the program manager guy who walked me out and told the public affairs guy to go away so this so is he's like, like a, legit spook guy ish or not spook yeah guy. like he's your age, fbi he's probably okay. like 45 i was probably like at the time what would i been like 25 26 maybe um uh, and so he's kind of like putting on the heavy kind of thing, <clears throat> but it's a little bit of that. Again, like you feel like you're being sort of like tapped into a secret society conversation. It's like, have you ever considered working for your government? Um, and he didn't give any indication at the time. So like about, I would say a good six weeks go by. I never hear from the guy. <clears throat> um, and I just think it's like fluky and whatever. And he just was like, talking out of his ass and, or somebody told him this is a terrible idea. I have no idea. But the point is, is that like, I was sort of open-minded to the idea. And I'd actually had a couple of conversations with friends, not with my bosses, because I was terrified that they would think that like, you know, I was about ready to quit or that I was going soft or something of like, could you actually do this? And like, there are instances of journalists who have gone to work for government I'm not aware of that many where they've then gone back into journalism, but it does happen. I mean, it's like, um, uh, who's the guy, uh, ABC News, the, the terrorism correspondent who became like the chief of police's strategy. Right. And there's also like the David Gergen types, yeah. right? Yeah, who, yeah. Um, who kind of drift in and out of White Houses. Cool. Right. So anyway, so six weeks go by. I figure nothing's going to come of this. Um I'm working on, I, I think I finished the FBI story and I started to get, I was started working on another story, um, which was a really cool story that was also about the FBI, about this um, uh, kind of the, the, like the first computer virus that the FBI ever tracked down before the 9-11 attacks. Uh, and they worked with the CIA to do it. And so I'm like, you know, in the, I'm very much in the FBI, CIA techie space. And of course, as I'm working on reporting this stuff, I'm just kind of like, oh, well, this is really interesting. God, I'm writing up these interesting people doing this stuff. What if I were actually the one doing it? And you kind of, your mind goes there and you sort of entertain the possibility. So six weeks go by, he calls me back out of the blue uh, and says, um, I want to continue the conversation that we had. 
So we go down to this like coffee shop that's like right around the corner from 10th and Penn where the Hoover building is. And he says to me, like, look, the Bureau is very interested now post 9-11 in trying to recruit people who don't necessarily have the same sets of skills that a traditional agent would. He said, I'm not recruiting you to be an agent, but I think that there is a path for you to be like an analyst, basically. Um, you already know a lot about technology. I was very clear, by the way, that I was like, I'm not interested in like going to work like on the FBI's computer modernization plan. He was more thinking of me as like a journalist who's kind of a synthesizer of information. And would I be interested in being an analyst? And they, I was young, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, I kind of understood how people communicate, I guess he thought. So anyway, for whatever reason, he thought you're kind of a natural fit for this and you should try it. <clears throat> and dangled out by the way the possibility of like you know and of course once you're in the bureau if you down the road like in two or three years wanted to apply to be a special agent that would be something that you might be positioned to do so it's not just like come be an analyst it's like you one day might be like fox Mulder or whatever um and it, honestly like it alien kind of sold me well maybe okay. if I, I did not ask if i get to work on the x files that was clearly a mistake on my part um, and honestly, he kind of sold me on it. And, you know, it was, it was like 80% excitement of being an agent, right? And I was young and like, to be perfectly candid, was working at a magazine that like was not a particularly well-known magazine. And I'm like, is this the thing that I'm going to keep doing for the rest of my career? Or, or would this be more exciting? Um, and then there was like a little bit of a 20% of like patriotism and you're serving your country. And like, look, I mean, it was, it was by that time, I think it was probably a year after 9-11, less than that. So I will admit that, yes, there was an element of having written about these people for, you know, up to a year now of kind of an admiration for what they did. So I said, like, okay, let's do it. And I began the process of applying to work for the FBI, um, which is a very lengthy process. You know, there is the standard, you know, the, in addition to your application, of course, there is the very rigorous background check that has to go on. Um, I go through, you know, all of the standard stuff. He warns me ahead of time. He's like, this is going to take a while. Um, do not inform your employer that you're doing this, which made me a little bit nervous. But then I kind of understood that, like, that's probably pretty standard, too. Like, you know, like you're not supposed to tell people you're applying for the CIA. Um, and we go through this and, you know, one of the things that's coming up in the, in the course of the background checks is obviously, you know, like, what are your foreign contacts? Like, you know, have you lived abroad? Do you have relatives abroad? You know, and I had studied in Spain my junior year of college, junior semester. So, like, I put down all the people that I lived with. I, I remember all the names of my professors. I was still in touch with the host family that I had lived with like five or six years earlier. So that was all very easy. And it felt like I'm being extremely thorough about this. I'm a journalist. I cross T's and dot I's. I know how to do all that. Um, we go through everything. They do the polygraph, which was ex like actually very unnerving <laughs> uh, and kind of scary because they do the poly and it's like you go through it and then they come back and ask you questions about questions you already answered. And basically implying that you haven't been truthful about the question. So we went through that little song and dance now, which now I know is like largely designed to kind of trip you up and maybe even to set some baselines. And there, I don't think there's anything wrong with the questions, but it's kind of scared the shit out of me and made me question, like, am I really doing the right thing? These people are kind of probing into my life. You know, if I if I say something that turns out to be incorrect in a polygraph, am I going to get in trouble? Um, all the while remembering, like, I'm still working on reporting about the FBI while I'm applying to work for the FBI. And my employers don't know this. And it's- And did of, you feel like this was ethically dicey? Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, and I think it was. Um, and that was giving me pause. But at the same time, it felt like we were getting so far down this road. And like, he had kind of leaned on me and like selected me and I was feeling like somehow I owed it to this guy to go through with this. And it was, it was a very mixed bag of emotions. And like, I already have like just the tendency to try and over please. And so I think that was taking over. Anyway, we go through the whole thing and just like nothing happens, nothing happens. 
And it's like weeks are going by and I'm not hearing anything. And I'm kind of of the mode like, well, this must be normal because it's taken so damn long up to this point. I'm just waiting for like the thing to process. And I guess do they call and like give you like offer you a job? I mean, I, I, my understanding was that like once you go through the process, then you're kind of like, these are the things that you're qualified to apply for, then you can go apply, people can look at your resume. It was kind of opaque to me, honestly. Um, but all this time goes by, and then the agent, this guy, calls again. And he says, listen, uh, you know, I need, to, I need to see you again. So we go to this coffee shop again. And he says, you know, I'm not really supposed to talk to you about this, um, but I'm just going to let you know it's not going to work out. Uh, and, you know, you should consider going ahead and withdrawing your application. And I'm like super freaked out, but actually kind of pissed at this point, because I feel very jerked around. Like you say you want to offer me a job. You give me this whole song and dance about, you know, post 9-11 and Americans have a calling and we're changing our ways and you're a young person and you're innovative and a real thinker and whatever. And like, and I go through all this torment of filling out these goddamn forms of this like stupid lie detector test or whatever the hell it is. And now you're telling me it's not going to work out. And I kind of really went into frankly reporter mode and got much more aggressive than I ever had been with people up to that point, which kind of like in the end, this is kind of like, but it was a useful growth exercise as a reporter. And essentially said to him, you know, you need to tell me why I am being rejected. Like I did everything that you asked. I disclosed everything. And while he was not completely forthcoming, he made very clear that the FBI and the, I guess in the course of my background check, maybe some other way, had become aware of people that I was in contact with overseas for the story that I was writing about the FBI catching this hacker who ultimately was determined to be based in London. Um, the most he would tell me was that there are people who we are aware of overseas, you know, bad actors who say they are in contact with you. And, you know, I am then thinking like, wait a minute, what you're mis you're you are mistaken somehow you think the people i'm talking to like who are my sources who i'm talking to for this story are somehow like foreign agents that i'm in contact with right like you're not you're missing something like no and i'm suddenly faced this moment where wait a minute i think i know what he's talking about i had been in touch for this story with like some shady people who were based overseas and knew about a piece of this operation, which the FBI ultimately busted. I was talking to them completely off the record. And then I'm sitting here thinking, wait a second, like this is where my mind goes. Like, was this entire thing some elaborate ruse to get me to disclose to the FBI who my sources are on this Ooh. operation that they busted up two years ago? And I'm not going to reveal my sources to this guy. Like, there's just no way that is happening. But he's kind of saying, like, you know, listen, you know, I can't tell you everything. But, like, you know, if you're a forthcoming about this with me, maybe there's a way we can still salvage this thing. And so I'm immediately just thinking, oh, my God, this is totally a trap. Like, they have talked me into this whole application process solely for the purpose of disclosing these contacts. And so I just, like leave this meeting and say basically i was just very polite and whatever uh and said you know um no thanks but no thanks like at the end of the day like what has become so obvious to me is that like they were not trying to lay a trap for me like the, the more i investigated this story the more i realized it was like this was a very open and shut case i think at the end of the day their ridiculous security clearance process could not compute the fact that of course a journalist is in touch with people overseas. Like, of course I'm talking to weird shady people. And I just genuinely think that they saw that and thought that I was some kind of computer hacker and that they had the paranoid conspiracy theory in mind and not me. Um, so yeah, it just died on the vine. I actually did a week later withdraw my application. There were no questions asked. Um, 
the only weird thing that, is, and I've never seen this guy again, by the way, and I've never applied to work for the government again. It left a very bad taste in my mouth. The only weird thing that is like a vestigial piece of his story is to this day, and I don't go very often down to the Hoover building because I mostly am covering the CIA and the intelligence agencies. <clears throat> Every time I go down, to the, and I do not have a hard pass for the FBI, by the way, I have to get cleared in every time I go because it's, it's rarely that I go. Every time that I go into that building, I get delayed at the security checkpoint. It's like being pulled over for secondary at TSA. And <laughs> rather than go through the whole rigmarole of this, this is the one good thing that this guy actually did for me, is he said, if you ever have a problem, give the person this phone number. And every time I go into the Hoover building, I have budget time for this because it takes 15 minutes or so. And they say, I'm sorry, like, are, did you call in for this? We need your social again. Are, are you on the list? And I was like, I understand. Just do me a favor. Call this number. And it's clearly the security office. And they call and, you, and like there's some file where I am where it's like, yeah, this guy's like a yellow flag, but don't worry. It's fine. He's cool. He's actually a reporter and not a hacker. To this day. All right. Oh, my God, I have so many questions. So I want to start uh, by noting the uh, uh, change in the poll over the course of the story. Uh, it started out almost dead even, a small minority uh, favoring the idea that you were lying. As you proceeded in I the story, think. no, the, the percentage thinking you were lying shot up as high as 56%. But by the end of the story... It is down to below 40%. Uh, okay. So uh, you have at least pre cross examination uh, done yourself um, uh, a service with the audience, at least. Kate, um, uh, get us started. You have three questions. Yeah, I'm going to use maybe two of them, but definitely one. I might wait for everyone else to ask questions. But my first question is. How long have you and Ben been friends? I met Ben in 2006 or seven because Jonathan Rausch introduced us when I was at, working at National Journal. And I started there in 05. Okay. That's correct. It, uh, uh, Jonathan Rausch asked me to meet with Shane uh, shortly after I came to Brookings. So it would have been sometime in 2007. Okay. And had I known Ben at the time, I would have sought his advice on this. My second question is to Ben, which I don't think counts as a question. So Ben it doesn't decide whether or not he wants to answer it. But Ben, have you heard this story before? I have never heard this story before. Um, but uh, I think in Shane's defense on that, there are several reasons why that story could be entirely true. And uh, that would still be the case. And two of them are, one of which is that Shane, Shane alluded to earlier, uh, that he was thinking about writing about it. And, um, uh, and the second one is, I actually think the ethical uh, complexities of the story um, might have inhibited his telling it um, uh, uh, earlier in his career. Um, okay. So I don't can think- I say, the Can fact... I say something on that, by the way? Oh, yeah, sorry. sure. I, I, and you didn't ask me this question, but if there's a question of why have you kept this secret for such a long time, it would have been, and I have changed my mind about this subsequently, but I think it would have been very strange to tell people that I had applied to work at an agency that I was actively covering. Yeah, that's, even that's though what I, I mean. Even though I didn't go to work there. I, I, I think that that's what I mean when I say the ethical complexities might have inhibited discussion of it. I had a... Uh, uh, not wholly dissimilar uh, interaction, not with, um, which was actually, I think, more ethically difficult um, uh, with uh, some people at the Federal Communications Commission um, uh, when I was about the same age. I think there's a, um, like, these things come up and you don't really, as a 24 or 25 year old, you don't really know who to talk to about them. Um, all right, your second question, Kate. No, that's all. No, you're reserving? 
I'm very okay. curious. I have uh, a, a, an initial question here. I, um, I, I'm curious, um, why you your attitude toward the government executive people wasn't to say, "Hey, I'm being recruited by the FBI." Um, how like how do I handle that is um, like it's an it's an immediate challenge to your ability effectively to produce the story in question. Um, why why didn't you go back and talk to your editor about it? So at the time I had an editor named Anne Laurent who was like my mentor <clears throat> and I was very confident that if I told her this um, she would be furious at me first of all and not just because of like the ethically dubious proposition that i was engaging in but that she would basically be like what the hell is wrong with you you're gonna go work for this organization that's like you know uh, you know i wouldn't say she thought the fbi was corrupt but she's like you know like it's not a good guy bad guy thing but it's like you know we're, we're on we're, we're on the bright side of the line and this is like you know you're going to like join the state and i thought better of you she was very much and very much is of the kind of you know, vein of journalists that, you know, is like IF Stone, right? It's like, we're there to be like the ink stained wretches throwing the bricks through the window. And she would have seen me as somebody who was somehow joining up with like, you know, the opposition. And I just didn't have the guts to tell her, to be honest. All right, Christopher Argerus, your first question. Um, okay, when, when you did the polygraph, uh, did, they, mm -hmm. did they ask you, they ask you all the questions in, in, in advance, like over the phone or just in, in some other venue besides being hooked up to the polygraph. I'm trying to remember because the guy who like quasi recruited me was saying to me, basically, this is how it's going to go. And so in that sense, I feel like I was being prepped a little bit for it. And I, I do remember having a, a sense of the kinds of things that they were going to ask when they did the exam. The thing that threw me for the loop was when they came back after it was finished. All right. Tom McGuckin, your first question. Well, um, I got a little confused on what I'm supposed to ask Mr. Harris about, but let me ask you this. When you, do you still do a lot of research on the FBI? Not as much as I used to, but because I, I don't cover them as much. I cover the CIA more. Okay. Well, let me ask you a question that's been in my craw for a long time. This had to do with the email, uh, what, the Wiener email leak from uh, What's-Her-Name's computer. Remember that? Uh, uh -huh. Right at the, uh, right at the, right before the, uh, for the, uh, right yeah. at the, before Election. the, yeah. So, I always had the feeling that the New York FBI office had some skeletons in the closet on that. And they sort of forced Comey into a corner. And well, I was just, Tom, what does this have to do? What does this have to do with the story? It's just has to do with the game show. Okay. So that that I'm wrong. Okay. Let me go back to <laughs> it has to be about whether I'm lying. Right. Okay, all right, fair enough. Listen, let me wait, go on to somebody else because I I have to now think about exactly. I actually had a security check myself and passed, so I right. I'm so, up on so, him. But so uh, we'll come back to you. All right, <laughs> Mike from this is the corner of the reporter episode. <laughs> the floor is yours. Nice oh, fire in the background. Nice Very fire. Nice. You look great. I, Hi. I had a kitten, but she left me. So sadly, I don't have pause to share. Um, oh. Since you something gave you pause before, and I thought I would share some, but I, I don't have them. I actually don't have any questions. Um, I'm actually just enjoying observing the um, the what is your reaction. Agnostic to... question. All right. This is, like this is you know we got one working. person who's who's <laughs> not. Uh, you guys are cheating. You yeah, you, you volunteer. Know. You the the artifact of the the artifact is the story, the yeah, and the story we was don't told. Know if it's and true or not, you have to interrogate it. 
I have interrogated this is... by listening to the story. I don't know no. enough to be able no, to ask. All right, so we're going to dismiss you two. We're going to. Tom says he's ready. Uh, we're going to bring him back on to, to this interrogate. This is easier than Sam. I thought, to be honest. <laughs> not this. This is not. I cannot. We got a bunch of softies. Where's Daniel Burge? He'll like yell I'm at you. Br- I'm bringing Paula on because she'll at yeah, least Paula grill the guest. Great. Yeah, Tom, you're getting fired for Paula. I know that you want to. No, no, no. Fun. Tom gets a second chance. Okay. Uh, go for it. Okay. So Shane, when you were looking at, I don't quite understand the ethical part of your thing. When you were applying to the FBI, you were saying. Uh, I'm a reporter. You didn't lie about your background, correct? No, they met me because I was there interviewing them. Yeah. Right. And uh, you didn't, the part that you didn't tell them was you were still doing a story. Is that correct? I, they knew I was there to do a story on FBI information technology modernization. They did not know I was working on the hacker story. Okay. So I'm a little confused. Uh, It just seems like reporters will do anything to get, information that's sort of yeah. what a reporter is so right. why do you, you consider what you did to have ethical sort of uh sort of cloudiness to it yeah because we can't we we you cover can't actually put yourself we don't go work for them yeah yeah, yeah. that would be like, like you know, i have to, it would violate all of my neutrality it would be like you know it's sort of like it's like you know you can't go the exchange cover you can't go of money play for, for the team certain... that you cover yeah exactly the, and then also be on the their ex- payroll it's really the exchange of money it's like the legit yeah. like it's why i can't take money whenever i like cover like from facebook to like be at facebook like i can't go work i mean i could go work at facebook and then that would be a very valid reason to critique my reporting on Facebook going forward. It's like the same thing for like going to work for the FBI. Yeah. Hmm. All right, Paula. Is that your green, your green, green, green rectangle? Yeah. I, uh, she's rectangle. at the FBI's computers. What's, just, what's with you, Paula? <laughs> you know, you, you, you set me up to wear this dog shirt and then you won't even show your face? Come no, on. I'm, can you hear me at least? Yeah, of course we can okay. hear you. I, I'll try to fix it later. I don't know what's going on with it. Um, I do love the shirt, though. Um, I So my question is, why do you think they're still delaying you when you go there now? Because I think uh, either first, if they were fucking with you, then mm-hmm. they clearly know that you're not a security risk. Or mm-hmm. B, they were being serious, but clearly you're not a security <clears throat> risk because, you know, it's years later and, well, you seem like a nice person. And so <laughs> why <laughs> do you think they still do that? I think I think it's just a basic bureaucratic incompetence. I think that in the course of my background check, you know, this apparently for them significant red flag came up based on what they consider to be my you know canoodling with foreign criminals um and that it's just flagged in the database like as this guy is a security risk and he's trying to get into our building and then it just sticks there the same way that like it's impossible to get yourself off of the secondary screening list at tsa in the airport if you've been flagged for something um, I mean, I no longer think that they think I'm a security risk. I think it's just, it's like stuck in the file and they like just aren't deleting it. And frankly, I go down there so rarely and I find it amusing that I've never actually tried to resolve it. All right, Paul, uh, 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 Kate, your second question. That's you, Kate. I know I'm like I'm like I'm like approaching the camera trying to like to think of something to say that I actually wanted to well I guess my question would be uh why haven't you told Ben this story before um partly because again there was I think there's just been a little bit of a hang up for me of did I do the right thing and when this stupid um also like, not that I think that Ben would write about this, but I feel like if I told Ben about this, I feel like Ben would try to get me to write about this. And he would, like, want to have me on a podcast to talk about it. And the truth is just, like, that I always wanted to write the story myself and kind of be, like, a very first-person essay about it. You just it, did get we, you to... 
he just did get you to go yeah, but, on the podcast to talk yeah, about it. Yeah, because we're not we're gonna, we're not going to do it at the post after all. It's just like we have too many irons in the fire right now, and it's just like there's I have other more pressing projects. And my editor was just like, just move on. This is not for us. Don't do don't do it. Um, I did not ask him whether I should come on and talk about it, but that's okay. My second question is, which coffee shop was it? Well, now it's a pull. I don't remember what it was back then. But it's the one like right around the corner from like 10th and like 10th and it's like, I want I feel like, is it like near the Navy Memorial or something like that? But like, do you know, like that, like that, that, that building, like it's like a very, it's like a half moon shape. It's not far from, uh, where is it um, in uh, reference to the, the Hotel Harrison? That no, all the... that's, I think the Hotel Harrison is further. Like, so if you're looking, if you're standing at the coffee shop going in, like on your left is Penn, and the hotel would be like a block up and over on 10th or on 9th, I want to say. But that's like at 9th and H or 10th and H. Okay. It's north, it's south, it's southeast of the Hotel Harrington. <clears throat> okay. Mr. Argerus, your third question. Second, Second question. Second question. Uh, Shane, can you um, reiterate or clarify where in the sequence of you meeting with this fellow um, was was it? Did he did he ask? Did he offer? Did he tell you to, to apply? Um, offer you the job or offer you to apply? And um, did you accept? saying you're going to, yes, I will apply. Was that all in the same meeting or is this over a sequence of, of meetings? So it was over a sequence. So the way it went is that I, I have my interview where I'm interviewing him for a story, him and his colleague. He walks me out of the building uh, and that's when he starts the conversation. Have you ever considered coming to work for the FBI or for the U.S. government? But he also specified the Bureau. And that's where he did the weird thing where he took my visitor's badge and said, you know, essentially, you know, I'll be giving you a call. Uh, and then six weeks go by and he calls. We go to the coffee shop for the first time and he basically pitches me on applying for the Bureau. Tom, your second okay. question. Yeah. You know, you've had a lot of people on here called Cypher and that lady that used to be an FBI agent now, I think, works for Yale. Um, uh, uh, what it is, I can't remember. At any rate, they seem to have this impression that the FBI is very rigid in its sort of procedural things and that this, this leads to the... Uh, the acronym uh, famous but incompetent. Have your feelings about the uh, FBI changed since what you dealt with was a rather rigid procedure uh, that didn't flex? Have they, do you know anything how they've evolved since then? I mean, that's, I guess, the uh, more open ended question, not so much on yeah. your story, but, uh, but it just wanted to get your impression of that. I mean, I will just say that, I mean, and for the purposes of keeping it about this story, <clears throat> I think as a young reporter, this experience was a like object lesson for me in what I consider to be bureaucratic incompetence and paranoia. And like, and like the idea that, I mean, again, my first reaction was this is a setup. And then I'm like, there's no way they could be clever enough to do this as a setup. Like they think the fact that I was emailing with, you know, hackers, which I was like somehow disqualifies me from working for the FBI. And it's like, this is stupid, you know? And if, and if that, if that's what gets me dinged after you like weirdly met me in a coffee shop and tried to get me to come work for you, you're not going to get anybody to come work for you. So I would say, you know, it left me with a pretty, you know, diminished view of their, certainly their hiring strategies, which they were like shouting to the roof about, oh, it's a new day at the FBI and we're going to hire these innovative people and break them old, like whatever. I mean, you still can't like, I mean, and, and I knew at the time that people often had a very hard time getting security clearances if they'd lived abroad, if they had family who lived abroad. And people were constantly telling me, including FBI, ex-FBI agents, how stupid that was and how much it was blocking qualified people from getting jobs. Paula, your second question. Okay. 
Can you at least hear me? I can't figure out. We can hear you just fine. You're you, you're doing your Doctor Doom imitation of being a disembodied voice. I'm trying. I'm not good with computers. Um, so I was wondering, do you think the person, the the guy who pulled off your badge, and I'm assuming the you said manager, upper manager, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Still works there, and. Do you know that or do you know anything about him or what happened to him? I'm assuming it's a him, I think. It's a him. Uh, and I've decided not to disclose his name simply because, like, I don't think it's germane to the story. I don't really want to, frankly, get him in trouble. Um, uh, because in the end, I don't think that I, you know, it was just a weird situation. I don't know if he's still there. When I met him, he must have been, to look at him, like, remember, I was 25. To look at him, I would have thought that he was in his mid-40s. For all I know, he was, like, 38 um but he could still be there i mean he was a fairly senior person given that he was working on it program management stuff i assume he like cashed out and went to go work for raytheon or something yeah and and most you know for most fbi are on a uh 20 year retire at 20 year retire at 50 uh program so it's probably uh not there anymore um Kate, your last question. Uh, did you ever find out if he, if the guy who plucked the badge off of you was in fact uh, of your same sexual persuasion or not? Or was that ever revealed? Did not. Did okay. not. And I would, it was just a very, it was, I'm just, it was flirty. It was just flirty. And I, again, I couldn't tell. I was like, is this something that men do with each other? Like as a, like a, like a straight man thing, like a male dominance kind of thing. Um, I will say though, I didn't get any vibe from him in our subsequent meetings. It didn't, that was the one, it just felt hmm. weird. And I, I, I look back on it and wonder if he was actually, what he was trying to do was be like, like secretive or dramatic somehow. And it just made me feel awkward. All right, I, I want to focus on the how you evaluate it in retrospect. You went through a period in the moment where you thought it was the whole thing, the whole application process was an elaborate ruse to get you to disclose sources yeah. among the hackers. But now you don't think that's what it was? So no, I think not. What yeah. what what caused you to change your mind and uh, decide that it was just a a, a, a silly incompetence thing um, rather than a clever ruse to get you talking about sources? I think the more that I reported on, which I was doing at the time too, on the security clearance process, because remember, like in addition to tech modernization. The whole streamline the security clearance process was one of those big post 9-11 initiatives. So I was doing reporting on that. And it just became clear to me how like cumbersome that process is and how people get dinged for stuff that seems like they shouldn't be getting dinged for it. Um, and frankly, like again, just the more I wrote about the bureau and realizing that it's just a giant bureaucracy. And you know, I don't think I appreciated this at that time, but later, you know. I can see now when I was a young reporter who had not written a ton about like privacy and, you know, investigatory rules, like it would be insane for them to do something like that. Like they're not going to like try and uh, trick an American journalist into divulging sources by having him apply for a job there. At, tr at age 25, when my only introduction to the FBI was really about like computers and old computers, I didn't have enough knowledge or sophistication to understand that this was something they would almost certainly never do. Did you ask me? Oh. Sorry, uh, your last question, Christopher. Okay, um, what was the status of your hacker story um, when, when you were ultimately rejected and did you go on to publish publish the story or did you abandon the story um and concurrently with your rejection 
Yeah, so mm. the, uh, the, the the status of the story at the time I was like, quote unquote, rejected was it had not been published yet. Uh, but I did go on uh, to publish the story and it published in, I think. Which you're not allowed to Google. No, I will. Okay, then I won't say anything about when, so you don't tempt it. But yes, I did ultimately publish the story about a joint FBI CIA operation to take down a um, proto hacker, basically. All right. Tom McGuckin, your last question. Okay, can you hear me? We can. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll just uh, go ahead with it. Listen, let's move on to what the Wall Street Journal might react to this, okay? In other words, now that you've outed the story, uh, I've had other people that have been outed. Uh, what do you think they're, your editors? Uh, uh, I have uh, people that complain about editors all the time. Okay, uh, what do you think your editors are going to think? Well, I mean, I think that, you know, some indication of that is, you know, what they've already said, which is like, you know, interesting story. Uh, I'm not really necessarily sure why we would put it in the Washington Post. If you're asking me, do my editors think that, I was wrong to apply for a job at the FBI. No, I mean, it was a long time ago. I was young. I think that, and you know, I don't know that they would ever say this to my face because we're not publishing the story. Um, I think that they probably would look at this and say, you should have disclosed it to your employer at the time. But again, to be clear, like I thought I wasn't also thought, I also thought I wasn't supposed to. That's another piece of this too. Like. I mean, aren't you supposed to be secretive when you're applying for these jobs? I'm like, no, not really. I mean, you can tell someone you're applying for the FBI. I think CIA, you're not supposed to tell people. Uh, but FBI, I think you can tell people. But yeah, I, I mean, I, again, it was a long time ago. But I'm, I think they're probably, I mean, maybe the reason that we're not publishing it is because they're like, we're saving you from yourself. <laughs> Paula, your last question. Um, yeah, have, I'm sure like you know a lot of people who used to work in the CIA um or fbi have you ever asked them what they think of the story because i can say from an outsider's perspective like it sounds kind of ridiculous like that type of procedure because i don't understand how anyone could ever work at the fbi then don't we all know don't we all have like contacts outside or like not contacts we all know people who live outside the united states we've all traveled outside the united states or a lot of people yeah, I mean, I've never told the story in this level of detail, but what I have come to understand from talking to lots of people about security clearance investigations is, you know, they are going to check out your foreign contacts and that can complicate things for you. It's not an insurmountable obstacle, right? I mean, the thing that gets you tripped up for real is if you don't disclose your foreign contacts, unless you're Jared Kushner, in which case you get a TSSCI clearance uh, from your father-in-law. But, um, you know, people can have foreign contacts they can have traveled abroad like that wasn't the issue the issue for them again what this guy was strongly suggesting was that they thought that i was actively like colluding with foreign agents like this wasn't like he lived in salamanca for three or four months in 1997 and knows people who are still in spain it was he's in touch with foreign people who are like considered like criminals by the US government, which of course I am. I'm a journalist covering computer security. So that was the thing I think that became the, we can't get past this piece. All right. We are ready for the big reveal, I think. Um, Don't you have one more uh, question? Uh, I thought, haven't we all gone through all our questions? Okay. Oh, I lost um, count of mine. Yeah, I think, but... I think everybody's done with their question, which means in reverse order, we're going to do uh, what people's judgment are. Let's start. This is your last chance to vote, folks. Shane was up as high as like 56% thought he was telling the truth. He's down to about 53%. It's a close vote among the audience, but he's got it narrowly. It's enough to win the governorship in Virginia, um, 53 Which I also ran for once. Which he also ran for once. All right, Paula, your verdict. Is Shane full of shit? Um, I'm going to say yes. 
uh, he like the story, it was told really well, but I can't get over the fact of like not telling your employer that that was going on and like juggling both of those things. Like, how do you even manage that? I don't know. That seems like a lot. Like I would have told someone I can't keep secrets. So. Yeah. I don't know. All right. So uh, we've got uh, you've got a narrow victory among the uh, 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 among the audience. The canine chorus, but uh, you're uh, you don't have Paula. What do you have, Jim McGuckin? Um, I uh, I uh, like the story simply because I don't think he has incentive really to lie. Okay, why would he be doing it? And so I, I well, have John a- Roush didn't have incentive to lie too, and he made up a whole yarn about the Atlantic sending him to, to hire a prostitute. Well, that's a story. <laughs> Now, maybe he's here to tell his story, but I I just uh, give him a thumbs up here and, and say that, you know, I'll continue to read his columns. Okay? All right. Thank you, Tom. So we got we got a vote of confidence from, from Jim McGuckin. Christopher Argerus, what do you have to say on this story? I'm going to say, like Joe's painting behind Shane, uh, the, the story is mostly within the lines of the orange and yellow, but there is some of the outside green green, uh, green shading. What does that even mean, dude? That doesn't dude? mean anything, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, it's, I love that answer, but we need a yes or no. He's telling the truth or he's yes, full of he's shit. Yes. He's telling the truth. Kate, what we got from you? No, he's full of shit. Wow. <laughs> two to two. So I break the tie here. By the way, the audience is slowly moving in the direction of your lying, too. You're down to 50, 50 points. <laughs> he he's getting a little bit more giggly as like it gets closer. <laughs> All right. I, I, here's my evaluation of this. I think... Um, so first of all, there are some important indicia of truth here. Okay. Um, it is true, absolutely true, that the FBI in this period was a very much struggling with the integrity of its computer systems, um, and that that is exactly the sort of thing that Government Executive Magazine would have been spending a lot of energy on. Um, it is also true that in this period uh, they were really struggling with the question of, okay, what's the kind of recruit that we want for our analytical uh, shop? They were trying to develop analytic capacity, which is something they didn't traditionally have in the CT space. And so a bright young 25-year-old comes in uh, from and asks really good questions it's a totally plausible thing that some senior person who's involved in the kind of reorientation under Mueller taps him on the shoulder or plucks the idea that this is the kind of person we're after. Um, I am, it is also completely plausible that once you are in a flagged system, you never get out of it, no matter how many times you walk into the building. And so somebody says, call this number, they'll clear it up, and you have to do it every time for 20 years. That's exactly the way the Bureau functions. If a bomb goes off, they are super good at figuring out who did it and everyone they've ever spoken to about everybody, anything, but, you know, getting a system to work well is just not the shit they do. Um, And so I think there is nothing implausible about this story. The one thing that bothers me about it is that I've never heard it before. Um, And despite that, I think it's true. Um, so that's my vote. Um, Shane, what's the big reveal? It's not true. (laughs) (laughs) I knew it. I knew it. This did not happen. What part of it, what part of it is true? 
There is a I part totally of it that is true. I would have, I was 100% with you for all, like, I actually believed you well into this. And then all of a sudden I realized there's no way that <laughs> Wittis doesn't know this fucking story. There's just no way. That's like, that was the thing. That was like, that and can I tell you, can I tell you, Kate, when I decided this was a story I was going to tell, I was like, this is the one part of a story that's going to screw me. It's going to be like, there's no way you didn't tell him this story. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, and like, yeah. yeah, it happened before I met so him. So wait, like, what part of the story is true? 20 years? Okay. The part of the yeah. story that is true is that, yes, I did go down and do an interview uh, at the Bureau about their IT systems. And the project manager guy did walk me out and what? did say, have you ever thought about working for the FBI? And did pluck the thing off and said, I'm <laughs> giving you a call. And he was totally flirting with me, just to be clear. Like this, I was like, you don't want to work me with me. You want to take me out and like, you know, and like not <laughs> yeah. drive back to your wife in Vienna. Okay, gross. He never called. He never called. He never called. There was nothing follow up about that. So you've never um, been denied a security clearance? Never even applied for one. Nope. Uh, Although the I, story about the uh, the hackers, uh, the, the FBI CIA operation, uh, that story is true. But I was not in touch with any hackers for that story. That story you can go read in Government Executive Magazine. It's called "The Worm That Turned: A New Approach to Hacker Hunting." That's so we great. are going to leave it there. Oh Shane my God, Harris, that's amazing. Well like done. Jonathan Rausch, uh, fools me does not fool Kate Klonick. Um, <laughs> um, I like the it. it's actually like a weird part of this that like the tell for me is like how other people react to the truth of the story it's like a collective intelligence question but yes we are gonna leave it there we will be back tomorrow for cheese night there will be a oh wait we have a surprise for you uh, a surprise sign off um, oh yeah uh, uh Shane Harris, you're a great American. We will be back tomorrow for Cheese Night. Uh, that'll be 22 hours and 58 minutes from now. And until then, Eve Guman wearing lion shirt. Wow. To match her hair. Yeah. So we're not until allowed, then. We're not allowed to have fun, but we are allowed to have increasingly funky wardrobes. Wardrobes. Indeed. Yes. Nice. <laughs> that is so true. Thanks.